From Deloitte's AI Institute, this is AI Ignition. A monthly chat about the human side of artificial intelligence with your host, Bina Amanov. We'll take a deep dive into the past, present, and future of AI, machine learning, neural networks, and other cutting edge technologies. Here's your host, Bina. Hello, my name is Bina Amanat. I am the Executive Director of the Deloitte AI Institute. And today on AI Ignition, we have Nick Thompson, Editor-in-Chief of Wired, a publication committed to figuring out how technology is changing the world. Welcome, Nick. It's great to have you on today's show. How are you doing? Thank you, Bina. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm doing as well as anybody during the corona apocalypse can with three kids starting Zoom school right behind us. You'll probably hear from them during this conversation. So here we are. That's great to hear. I think it's, uh, you know, we're actually getting more family time, right? So on the positive side, (laughs) that's great. Yeah, there are real there are real benefits to that. So I'm all for that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, uh, one of the questions that uh, I, I've always been meaning to ask you is, uh, can you share about the craziest story that you've ever written about at Wired? <laughs> yeah, I can happily do that. And in fact, there's one that jumps right to mind. So I've done a lot of crazy stories. I you know, one of my favorite crazy stories was trying to track down whether the Russians actually built a doomsday machine that was reactivated under Putin and talking to Russian nuclear scientists and meeting with, you know, secret you know, Russian scientists and like getting my wallet stolen when I went to Moscow and worked on it and having it returned with everything but the business cards. But that's not the craziest one. The craziest one was a story I did with a guy named Evan Ratliff. And it was in 2009 And we were both really interested in the question of what it takes to disappear digitally. It seemed like a lot of people were kind of going off the grid, maybe faking their deaths, trying to start a new life. And Evan and I and two other friends got extremely drunk one night. And we came up with this idea that he would do a two-part series. First, he would write about how you go off the grid and disappear and fake your death. And then he would do it. And I would organize a manhunt to try to find him. And so we did it. He wrote a story and it was terrific. And then he went on the run. And I, the rule was that I would have all the information that a private investigator would have. This is very early in Twitter. It was the first time I really used Twitter. And I would post all that information on Twitter. And we got thousands of people looking for him, posted all these clues. I interviewed his family members. I posted the information online. He tried to disguise his steps. He shaved his head. He ditched his car. He traveled around the country. He sort of hooked up with a band that was on tour. And then eventually he was found. The deal was if somebody would find him within a month, they would win $5,000. And if they didn't, he would get $5,000. And at the end, the last few days, I started giving out more clues. And there was a clue. If you solve the New York Times crossword puzzle, there was a clue that we had gotten Will Shorts to embed. And it revealed that Evan had to go to a book reading that day. And meanwhile, he had screwed up using Tor at one point, which had revealed his Twitter account to a really smart user who had followed his new identity's Twitter account as a fembot, so Evan wouldn't suspect anything. And then by tracking the IP address of the Twitter account, had realized that Evan was in New Orleans. And so suddenly there was a whole group of hunters who went to all the book readings in New Orleans and found him. So it was awesome. so is, is the conclusion that you cannot disappear digitally? Well, the conclusion is that back then our writer couldn't disappear. It's interesting right now, like it's both, it is harder to disappear now, right? We have so many more digital footprints, so many more breadcrumbs we leave behind. It would be very, very hard to disappear, but you know, there are also tools for disguising, right? You know, I can um, yeah. I can set up a VPN in two seconds right now, which I couldn't back then. Um, I can disguise my tracks in certain ways. In fact, let's try it. So, Ina, <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go on the run and I'm going to try to find you. I think it's probably harder to disappear now than it was then, but yeah. it can be done. It can be done. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so, um, you know, uh, you've been covering the tech world for a long time. Uh, I mean, you know, there, there are, I'm sure there are a lot more crazy stories that, that we could talk about. But are there change, you know, some, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the past 10 years besides, uh, you know, becoming harder to disappear digitally? <laughs> are, there, are there some, you know, big changes that you've seen how tech has shaped the world? Um, and um, yeah, can you share your perspective on the past 10 years? Yeah, the last 10 years are so interesting because mm -hmm. there have been all kinds of magical innovations. There have been you know, many of the best things that we forecast would happen have happened. But what's happened over the last 10 years is tech has gone from you know, being outsiders and challenging the power structure to being the power structure and to, you know, the most powerful and important companies on earth are all tech companies. The people with the most influence over American culture, American democracy are executives of tech platforms. So tech, and this is an interesting challenge for Wired, right? Because Wired started as a magazine yep. championing mm -hmm. the tech industry and pushing the narrative that change is good and that whatever tech brings you will be positive. And now we're not pushing a bunch of scrappy outsiders with great ideas. It's we're doing the opposite, right? We're challenging a bunch of insiders with maybe too much power. So the whole narrative of the tech industry has changed the way people think about the tech industry from, you know, small, cool, and scrappy to gigantic and in some ways threatening has changed, maybe overcorrected. But that's a massive, massive shift. And it's happened slowly over the last 10 years and then very quickly over the last four yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I've studied things like assembly language and COBOL, and at that time, tech was more in the back office, right? Yeah. Uh, now you hear more and more that every company is a tech company. Right. Uh, it's almost. Uh, and uh, what what's your take on uh, you know that statement of every tech every company, no matter which field you're in, is a tech company. Yeah. Well, so not entirely true, right? I was just, you know, paying a bill to the guy who, you know, is big deal building a trench in our backyard and he has a small operation. Yeah, we communicate by email and I send him a check via, you know, automatic payments and chase, but he's not a tech company. I mean, in some ways, like, you know, the hydraulic lifter is, is, is technology, but not every company is a tech company, but more and more. I mean, a very interesting example is my industry media, right? Are we, are we a tech company? In some ways we have to be. And in some ways the struggle of the media industry has been to understand how it has to do that. So there are very interesting opportunities in every industry as creative people recognize where tech can change old sclerotic processes or AI can change old sclerotic processes and make them much more efficient. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, you know AI has uh, is another one of those where it, it it's disrupting across several industries, and you you as you look across these um, industries where AI is disrupting, what are some of the areas that you find most exciting, or, or think about you know what are some of the areas that you didn't see happening or getting disrupted, but have, have gotten disrupted or have changed. Yeah, you In know the, the most years. the most interesting to me right now is medicine, and of, of course AI would disrupt medicine, but it's it's an area where technological change is surprisingly hard. And there's this interesting dynamic where medicine is the area where both change is most important, and you could get the most benefits through big data analysis. Right, you could really get everybody's health records, make them transportable, understandable, and do machine learning on them. The capacity to develop new drugs and make people healthier is profound, right? So sort of the potential net benefits to humankind of machine learning and medicine are massive. On the other hand, the potential privacy violations could not be higher either, right? So you have this tension between huge benefits to the group and huge risks to the individual. And so over time, the healthcare industry has been a little more resistant to innovation than I would have expected. And it's partly because of the privacy concerns. It's partly because it's a highly regulated area, which is highly risk averse. But then what happened is COVID and people were afraid to go into the hospital and everything shifted online. And the number of telemedicine claims has gone up 4,000% or whatever the number is. And the amount of innovation we're now seeing in medicine 
And the long-term effects of that, it's just astonishing. And you're going to start seeing telemedicine booming. You're going to see the invention of technologies that allow for at-home data gathering of a kind we've never had before, right? You know, we'll be you're doing sonograms at home. You can already do stethoscopes at home. Like the things that will be built in medicine in the next few years, in part because of Corona and in part because of the innovation unleashed are extraordinary. So I would say medicine, number one, you know, education, probably number two, but a lot of areas with big, big change. What I've seen is also the fact that the te core technology of AI is evolving and then the applications of AI is growing, accelerating, mm -hmm. and then there's the risks and consequences, right? Whether we talk about the ethics, privacy, security. Yeah. So that's like three parallel streams and each one is still evolving. Yeah. None of it is mature on its own. Um, so, and yeah, this also raises that interesting point on, you know, what, what's the new roles that get, get created. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, just looking back 10 years, right, uh, the roles, uh, you know, we hear a lot about jobs being taken away by yeah. AI, but we also see new roles that get created. Uh, my question to you would be, what is a role that you didn't see coming or what you were surprised and, you know, you're like, huh, I didn't, uh, you know. I never imagined that a role like this would exist to have existed 10 years from now. That's a good question. So I would say the thing that's been most interesting to me recently was a conversation I had with somebody who's, you know, deep into this question and I was pushing it. I was saying, so, you know, where is AI really changing businesses in surprising ways? And the answer was, what we're learning is that most companies that hire AI researchers and just say, hey, we need an AI strategy. We've hired three people who know AI. We've put them on the data science team and they're over there in cubicle nine. That's not working. And But what really is working are companies where they've figured out systems where AIs and humans can work together to be more efficient. And so, you know, going back to medicine, there is long this hypothesis that um, AI would replace radiologists, right? And so that was kind of the iconic example. And if you read any book on AI published between 2007 and 2016, it will talk about radiologists. And what we've actually seen is that um, image recognition has improved as expected. AI is extremely good at reading images and identifying tumors, but it hasn't replaced the radiologist. What it's done is it's allowed the radiologist to be much more efficient, right? And I interviewed a radiologist not long ago who, um, said, well, sure, I work with an AI and it means that I can look at 100 scans a day and it will give me probability scores of each of them, which allows me to sort through them much more quickly. So I think that what's happening with AI in the best cases are companies and individuals kind of moving up, um, moving up the chain. I'll give you another example that I love. I was talking to somebody else at, at another company and what they've done is they've used it's kind of a meta AI example where they've built an internal training system where they identify what are the jobs that are likely to change the most in the future? Where are we going to have the most needs? Which of our employees are most at risk of therefore losing their jobs? And how can we upskill them? And then helping to push those employees into education systems to learn the new skills. So in some ways, it's using AI to identify how AI will change the organization and then training people in AI. And this company has shifted huge numbers of jobs without having to do layoffs, which is a really, really interesting thing to have done. Several industries have changed. And, you know, can you speak a little bit about how has the media industry, media business changed? You've introduced a lot of new concepts uh, and uh, like the paywall. But, you know, how has the business itself evolved with AI in the past few years and what are some of the jobs that exist today which didn't exist in media industry 10 years ago? The first is changes in advertising and, you know, the central source of revenue for newspapers and magazines used to be print advertising and people trying to reach bundles of readers who like that subject area. Of course, the internet made that mode somewhat obsolete you know, to reach people who like golf. You don't have to put an ad in golf magazine. You can just you know, buy an ad on any social platform targeted at people who have searched for golf or who like golf. So the advertising market has gradually declined um, and that's put a lot of financial pressure. So the way that we countered that or the business model we built at The New Yorker and our building at Wired was primarily about subscriptions and paywalls, which is, okay, fine, we're not gonna get ads, 
let's just make content that people like and say, you have to pay us to read it. And that's worked quite well at both places. We've also branched into the business model of affiliate reviews. So for example, we'll review a bunch of headsets, headphones, and if you click on one, we'll get a cut. So that is a rapidly growing business area for us. Um, and that's terrific and good. Other companies have done more in events or they've done, um, you know, all sorts of other ways to compensate for the loss of advertising. Though, of course, the number of jobs in media has declined massively because, you know, we were supported by advertising. So then what about AI and technology? Well, there are some uses for it. So I built a company on the side. It was a really interesting media business model. It's called The Atavist. And what we did is we did one long-form journalism story a month, and we would present it in a really crafty, interesting way, layering video, audio, and text. And then we built a custom CMS to support it and then licensed that CMS. So we would basically test the CMS through our journalism, improve it that way, and then license it out to other companies. It was a good company. We sold it to WordPress. It was a successful, happy outcome for a journalism entity. You know, there are other companies that have done some AI, used some, built some AI tools for image recognition, for sorting through headlines. But, you know, at some point, AI will be used to help reporters, it'll be used to copy edit stories, it'll be used to fact check, it'll be used for legal review, it'll be used to make assignments, it'll be used to write stories. Right now, you know, AI can write sports scores, sports stories, but really nothing of complexity. Mm. And why is that? Uh, is that because, uh, you know, uh, the, the, um, there is a lack of the domain expertise and the AI specialist connecting is that, um, you know, there needs to be some cross pollination, the domain subject matter experts driving the needs, the demands from the AI experts to actually build that out. I think it's a couple of factors. So one reason why is because as revenue declines in journalism, the incentives of all the executives is not to let's research and build something new. It's let's hang on to, you know, let's save as many jobs as we can, right? And you go through 10 rounds of budget cuts, then it's very hard to make an investment in something new because there's a perception that every new dollar spent on something means, you know, one other person's job is lost. So because it is very hard to invest in the new in a declining industry, though, of course, that is where you most need to invest in the new. So that is a challenge. Another issue is the actual complexity of the type of AI that will be most beneficial in journalism. So AI is good at you know, image recognition. It's good at speech recognition. It's good at pattern finding. It's not good at writing. You know, you know, there's GPT-3 and there's some examples and some people have taken a crack at writing, but like the nuances of language um, evade even the best AI right now. So that has slowed down AI in our field, right? There's, you know, there still could be AI used in, you know, back office solutions and web hosting and all of that. But in the core of the work we do in journalism, I think it's AI's use is relatively limited. And you mentioned education briefly as one of the industries that we'll actually see a lot of traction with AI. And, uh, you know, with with what we're going on to, uh, you know, with the what the world is dealing with right now and remote education. What, what do you see some of the opportunities around education and even employee training, as you were speaking about earlier? Um, what, what are some of the opportunities there? Oh, it's massive, right? If I were to start a new company, I think, you know, I would certainly look in the field of education right? because the possibility of using AI to customize an education platform for a child, right, to, you know, figure out okay, we've looked at a million tests from seventh graders and we've looked at your seventh graders tests and we've actually not only understood what his weaknesses are, but how to correct those weaknesses and then how to tailor our teaching for his particular ambitions. Those are massive. And I haven't seen any of that, right? There's no, there's no sense, you know, my kids go to a very good school in Brooklyn. There's no sense that there is a custom AI system tailoring their learning. And there should be. You know, we should, it should be an area where we have the data, we have the expertise. So I immensely look forward to the day when kids at school in America are, you know, AI is running in the background to figure out how to help them get smarter and meet their goals. Yeah, yeah. What, what are some of the other industries where AI hasn't made an impact, but you think there is a huge opportunity there? So I'm, okay, another one that I'm really interested in, and this is the most important one there is, is, is the Defense Department. So 
There, the question is, like, to what degree will AI, will the Defense Department allow AI in the creation and programming of weapon systems? And it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated question because you have two things that are, could not be more in tension, right? So number one is that military decisions have to be explainable and they are of such grave stakes that we want humans to be involved. Like the notion that an AI system could be programmed to kill another human makes, should make any human stomach churn, right? Just the, as I say that sentence, it should make everybody uncomfortable. But then uh, in contrast to that, there's the fact that the faster a military system can respond, the more likely it is to win. And in fact, if there were a conflict between one country and another country, country A and country B, and country A used AI to make decisions and to target weapons, and country B did not, country A would win. And so by standing up for your principles and keeping AI out of decision-making loops, you would put your nation's military and therefore your nation's civilians at risk. So how do we balance that as we go forward? Do we allow... AI program systems to make kill decisions? Do we allow AI program systems to launch defensive weapons? Would we ever allow an AI system to order a preemptive nuclear strike based on details that it had learned about an adversary's nuclear ambitions? So you can imagine all hell breaking loose because of this. It's, it's at the very least something to watch. Yes, I agree. And yeah, it's, um, uh, the whole discussion around ethics and uh, building our trustworthy applications of AI is, is is um i think there's still a lot of work to be done in that space have you um, have you seen any um advances in uh, whether it's protection of privacy or any of the aspects around ethics driving explainability transparency reducing bias are there any technologies or tools um, that have excited you in uh, where they have actually, you know, started making, uh, uh, you feel that technology is promising to actually tackle those ethical challenges? Yeah, great. A great, a great question. So I, what I've seen tons of progress in is in this conversation, right? Every company that now is advanced in AI has an ethics team, has an ethics consultant and has ethics paradigms, right? And they have people thinking through how to avoid racial bias, how to avoid discriminatory outcomes, how to avoid, you know, letting biased data sets influence decisions, right? And then you have people who not only are trying to avoid biases getting into the algorithms, but also who are examining the impact of the algorithms for differential outputs. So that is, you know, and it, maybe it's clearest in the conversation about facial recognition, right? Where we have had, it is a now a well-known fact you know, anybody who follows tech knows that facial recognition has a harder time identifying black people than it does white people. And it's unclear exactly how big the difference is, how frequent the errors are, but the notion that law enforcement would then use a racially biased system is anathema to more or less everybody, right? There's more or less universal agreement. And then there are examples of, you know, the famous example of the black man in Detroit who was arrested for a crime he didn't commit because the algorithm couldn't tell him from the actual criminal, right? And so there is consensus that that is a substantial problem that has to be fixed if we're going to go forward with facial recognition. So that is an area with, I think, real progress. Now, what you don't want is you don't want to completely block technologies because there might be any sort of bias. What you want to do is build the technology so there's minimal bias, audit the results so that there's minimal bias, and do everything you can to socially to find socially optimal outcomes. Cause I think that you can have facial recognition system that is net beneficial. You just have to work really hard to build it. Right. Right. And, and I think a lot of it is also the context specific, um, broader than facial recognition. If you look at image recognition, right. Uh, it might be in a way you're using it on a manufacturing plant for safety, uh, right? Being able to recognize those images and actually provide safety guidance or warnings um, is, is super important. The other thing is also it comes to the fact that we don't really have clear regulations or that stream itself is evolving, right? The third stream, the consequences, the risks, and how do you mitigate that? 
Um, so uh, I think it will take a few time. Do you think as, as we evolve on the technology side, um, the risks and consequences can grow at the same pace in able to help drive, continue to drive innovation, but with the guardrails? Yeah, and I think that's where we are, and I'm very heartened by it. One of the big changes, you know, I've been in this job four years, is over those four years, as I've watched this closely, I would answer that question much more confidently now than I would have four years ago. And I feel like the number of people who are building those guardrails and aware of those guardrails is increasing by the day. So I think that the tech industry you know, went through a reckoning in 2016, 2017. It was a reckoning in a thousand ways. It was a reckoning over privacy. It was a reckoning over consequences. It was a reckoning over, you know, democracy. It was a reckoning over attention and what tech is doing to our brains. There was an, an immense and interesting reckoning. But I now think that technology and the technology industry and every product manager in America is aware of this and thinking about this. Nick, you have a pulse on this space. What would be your advice to someone who wants to stay on current on AI, besides reading Wired, of course, <laughs> and following you on social media? What would uh, you know? What would you suggest uh, for someone to stay current on AI? How to stay current in AI? So, I mean, Wired has a dedicated AI section where multiple reporters focus on the issue. So, I'm glad to give it a shout out. I think that podcasts are a really terrific way to stay up to date on AI. There are all kinds of super interesting conversations that happen constantly. I like um, email newsletters. You know, I like the OpenAI newsletter, Jeffrey Ding's newsletter about AI in China, I think is really quite good on a, on a pressing topic. You know, there are new books that come out every six months. They'll be a really good one. And so you know, reading two to four books a year on AI and where it is, I think is a, is a useful strategy. The best one I've read recently is probably um, Kai-Fu Lee's AI Superpowers, which came out, came out last year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mix of books, podcasts, newsletters, and websites. Uh, Nick, how can people stay connected with you? Where can they follow you? Well, I do daily videos on what I think is the most interesting thing in tech, and I post those on you know, LinkedIn, where I'm Nicholas Thompson, and you can follow me there or connect with me there. I post them on Facebook, where I'm NX Thompson, Nicholas Thompson, and then I tweet all the time. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Strava. I'm on Periscope. I'm, 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 I'm out there. But it's mostly just you know NX Thompson, and it's the same avatar. Because there's a Nicholas Thompson who's an ultimate fighter. There's one who's a golfer, but you know I'm the guy with with glasses on a bridge. I have been watching your videos for several months now and I really love it. So <laughs> I would give a huge shout out to, you know, that's one of the best ways to stay current on tech news. Just follow Nicholas's videos on LinkedIn. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm delighted to hear you say that. I, you know, and I put, it's interesting. I put a fair amount of effort into them. You know, it's three minutes a day, but it's an important, you know, my job is as editor in chief of Wired is so bureaucratic and there's so much of this and so much of that. But I, I'm committed to this in part because I love it, in part because I you know, get feedback from smart people every day, and in part because it's a way of forcing myself to stay inside the tech news, which I think is important. Nick, thanks again for being with us on the show, and I want to thank our audience for tuning into AI Ignition. Be sure to stay connected with the Deloitte AI Institute for more AI research and insights. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Check out our AI Ignition page on the Deloitte AI Institute website for full video and podcast episodes. And tune in next time for more thought-provoking conversations with AI leaders around the world. This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com backslash about.